This is Johnny and Jose with Tiger Bomb MMA, and tonight we'll be going over UFC Fight Night Blades versus Lewis. Heavyweight bout where we'll potentially see Curtis Blades fighting for another title shot against either Stipe or another, what, the third fight against Ngannou. And if Lewis gets the win over Blades, that puts him right up there in title contention. With his popularity and all, and, you know, nice little run going, he should be fighting for the title again. Uh, to begin the card, we have a fight. According to Tapology, it's the first fight of the night, but I don't know if it's even happening. According to the UFC website, it's not official yet. But we've got Rafael Alves versus Pat Sabatini. Uh, Rafael Alves just recently got his contract from the Contender Series where he got a submission over Alejandro Flores. Very, very impressed by this guy. I know his record is a little off. It's 19-9. and nine. But he, he looked really good. It's almost like the Charles Oliveira effect where he took a ton of losses, but he now is at that spot where he's just looking unbeatable. Uh, currently, the odds are minus 190 for Rafael Alves and a plus 165 for Pat Sabatini. At, at first, I was confident that Rafael was going to come in here and just run over Pat. But after doing a bit more research on Pat, watching a bit more tape, He's a pretty legit guy. He's well-rounded, very good wrestler. According to his LinkedIn page, he's very high on himself. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting match. I, I actually see some value on Pat just because although Alves is very explosive and very hard-hitting and very opportunistic with submissions, I think Pat Sabatini is just as equally as good on the ground as Rafael. Maybe not as explosive, but he's just so technical on the ground. One thing to note, he did get his arm broken against the matchup against a, a James Gonzalez, where it, it looked just like a, it was nasty. But yeah, that, that's something to be concerned about, especially with a guy who's good on the ground like Alves. It's going to be a lot closer than, than what people actually think. Right now, Alves is what, almost two to one favorite. I think it should be a pick em, in my opinion. I, I think Pat Sabatini could just... I don't want to say I'll grapple him, but I'll position him because uh, with Alves, he's very explosive. He could really burn out his gas tank, and I can see Pat taking over. He is the better wrestler, and yeah, I see him riding out the rounds of Usman style on top of him and just getting out the decision. So I'm going to go with Pat Sabatini to win this one, especially at dog odds by uh, decision. Uh, I don't really have a side on this one. Uh, just because I think their, I think their ground games are gonna cancel each other out. Um, even though Pat, uh, I guess, I guess maybe uh, I'd give the edge a slight edge to Pat on the ground, uh, because of his wrestling. Uh, on their feet, I'd say they're about the same. Um, now their records. Now, now people just, just taking a straight look at their records, you're gonna say, oh, you know what, Pat has. Uh, you know, the better record. Um, however, uh, looking closely at Rafael's record, as of late, he's actually been putting it together. I'd say in the last uh, three, three plus years, uh, he's put together a nice uh, win streak. He did take some L's prior to that, but it was against, you know, uh, people with decent records, you know, 10 and 3, 12 and 4, 13 and 1. Uh, and then earlier on in his career, uh, he fought a guy. You know, thirty six and fifteen, took a loss there, but you know, dude, that guy had a ton of experience when he barely had you know a little over ten fights on his uh, in his career. I'm gonna say, being that both guys is uh, ground game is fairly even for the most part. I'm gonna say this. Is, uh, I'm actually gonna take the over on this. I'd say this definitely goes over, <clears throat> over the two and a half rounds. Um, they're both the same age, uh, you know, they're going to be the same weight, uh, and they're about the same height. I'd say whoever is, whoever turns on the aggression, uh, is going to get the slight edge. I think is going to, that's at least as a, you know, not me as a judge, but as, a, you know, as, a, as a judge, if I were one, um, I think that would probably sway me, you know, even if, if both guys' skill sets are, you know more or less mirroring each other. I'd say the guy coming forward, the guy, you know, pressing the action uh, is going to get a slight edge in each round, you know, short of either Pat or Rafael's, um, you know, 
somehow, you know, jabbing the hell out of one, you know, one or the other, uh, and really lighting up, you know, lighting them up uh, on their feet, a la, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, Rafael Alves all of a sudden turns into, you know, championship uh, Rafael Dos Anjos. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to take a side. Uh, I think I'll take the over on this one. Our next matchup at heavyweight, we've got Sergey Spivak versus Jared Bandera. I uh, don't know really what much to say about this one because I honestly have not been too impressed with Jared. He is coming in here as a plus 175 favorite against Spivak, a minus 230, I'm sorry, a plus 175 underdog for Bandera and a minus 230 favorite for Spivak. And I'm not impressed by either guy, really. I will say, if anything, I've been slightly more intrigued by the progression of Sergey. I think his jab has gotten really good, and he's got wrestling in the back pocket. But he tends to fight guys that are smaller than him. That's how he tends to get the the win. Uh, when he fights guys that are closer to his size or that can match his weight or are just faster than him, they tend to beat him up. Marcin Tybura just out grappled him against the cage for a decision win and Walt Harris just ran through him really quickly so I, I am curious to see because on paper Sergey's fought the better competition uh, so they both fought Tony Lopez the regional king and uh, Jared went to decision with him and Sergey actually beat him by neck crank so it's very interesting because I guess Jared's record is not UFC caliber he, he got his his uh, position by beating Harry Hunsucker in the Contender Series, and he beat him by ground and pound. But when on the feet, he was getting beat up. I wasn't impressed by his stand-up. Uh, it's probably honestly going to go to a decision, and it's hard to really pick a side because I, I'm leaning towards Sergey, but I can see an upset happening here, really. Uh, my concern is Sergey's not really good with fighting dudes similar size to him and that have equal to better wrestling. So it could just be a stand-up fight. I see Jared being the tougher guy and just grinding through uh, for takedowns. So I'm going to lean towards a decision for Vandera, but I'm not ultimately confident because, again, this is a, a toss-up in my opinion. So Spivak has to show me something that shows that he belongs in like the top 15 of the heavyweight division. If he doesn't show me that here, then yeah, he's just going to be another alternating win-loss record guy in the, in the UFC. So tentatively, I'm going with Vandera. Let me take a look at both guys. I think it's fairly close. However, I am giving the slight edge to Sergey uh, just because he has fought uh, the better competition. Uh, he does have more rounds in the UFC. While he has alternated losses, he's two and two in the UFC. His most his most recent win was against Carlos Felipe, which he did decision Carlos Felipe. However, looking at uh, what Carlos Felipe has done as of late, uh, he actually did go toe to toe with Jurgen Castro and Justin Taffa, and while they weren't I wouldn't say he's necessarily, you know, going to be a contender in the near future uh, or realistically uh, in his career. He may or may not get into the, the top 15 at some point, depending on how watered down the heavyweight division gets, you know, assuming he sticks around that long. He, he did take, uh, he did take them, you know, to decision, which yeah, they're they're actually both tough guys. So I think I think that gives him the slight edge, just having fought better competition thus far in the UFC. He isn't all that impressive. I think he will have the bet the better output in the fight. While Jared uh, has, you know, the the records are uh, I think on par, but you know, short of Jared uh, getting the knockout in the first round. I think if it goes to the second and third round, uh, I think uh, Sergey's going to have the better gas tank uh, and get the decision. I think Jared's probably going to want, probably going to come out pretty hard in the first round. 
and maybe gas out. And I think Sergey will uh, should have enough to survive that uh, and take over the next two rounds. So I am going to take Sergey in this fight, and I believe it will go to decision. Our next matchup at Bantamweight, we've got Eamon Zahabi versus Draco, the great Dracolini Rodriguez. Uh, another guy from the Contender Series coming up. We've got uh, Draco coming in as a minus 190 favorite. The turnaround on Zahabi is a plus 165 underdog. And narrative right here is the younger guy coming in from the Contender Series is just going to boot out the, the lesser of the brothers and the Zahabi brothers uh, because his his record for Zahabi hasn't really been impressive in the UFC. He's, what, 2-1. and one. And he's faced a horrible, dis disgusting knockout by spinning back elbow from Ricardo, from Ricardo Ramos. And he lost to a decision to uh, Vince Morales, which is kind of a the bar to see if you belong in the UFC. If you can't beat Vince Morales, then you're at a certain level. At this point, it's hard to go against uh, Draco Rodriguez, really. He should be coming in here the faster, more aggressive fighter. His hands should be better. I don't know how he'll beat him, but I I know Rodriguez should edge him out in every way. I know Zahabi has experience, right? We, we've talked about this before when it comes to the brothers. That dynamic, let's let's move away from that. But Zahabi seems like the type of guy who's really good in training, and he just doesn't know how to implement that in a real fight. Like, he has all the data, but when he's in that situation, it just loses it. He, it's gone. So it's really hard to trust a guy like that when it comes to betting or even picking him to win a fight. Maybe he'll come back here. Maybe he's gotten his shit together. He hasn't fought since, what, almost two years. So we could see a brand new Eamon Zahabi. I don't want to take that risk. I'm still going to go with Draco to win. I'm going to say second round knockout. I'm also going with Draco, uh, but I'm just going based off his nickname, the great Dracolini. I think that alone uh, has secured his victory for him this weekend. I think he actually might get the submission. I don't think, uh, well, being that this is a uh, bantamweight fight, I don't believe Zahabi has taken the time to actually improve himself. I think it's kind of a two-sided coin, I think, uh, working with his brother, because while his brother is a great trainer, he is his brother. So I don't know. I, I don't believe his brother maybe, be, maybe is as honest with him as he should be. And that's just with regards to improving the skill set. Uh, he has, he's, he's got a lot of holes to fill and I don't think his brother is willing to fill those holes. You can take that however you want. Um, but, you know, he is, you know, nine years a senior and he is basically a senior citizen in, in that division. He's over the hill at 33 years old. I don't believe he has He's, you know, he has either the gas tank, uh, the endurance uh, to keep up with uh, the younger guys in that division. And I think he's, his, his career trajectory is, is uh, spiraling downward at this point. Whereas Draco, I think he's on a slight uptick. And I think with, with this win, Draco's going to uh, not necessarily put himself on the map, but gain a little bit more notoriety and start working his way up in the UFC. So I'm taking Draco uh, by submission. Our next matchup at Featherweight, we've got the return of Chaz, the scrapper Skelly, and Jamal, pretty boy Hammers. A pretty damn good fight. I'm really excited to see Chaz Skelly come back into the UFC. He's been away for, what, a year and a half now. Uh, he's had some pretty bad luck in the UFC. I guess good and bad luck. He, he had that weird submission loss to Bobby Moffitt, but it looks like it was overturned kind of quietly. I didn't hear about it too often. And then he came back and got a decision over Jordan Griffin, which you can take that as however you want. It's a win, but it's against Jordan Griffin. As for Jamal Emmers, I don't know what to say about him. He, he lost to Giga Chikadze. And a pretty good back and forth fight, a fight that many people thought he could have won, but here or there. He did lose to Julian Erosa in a spot, I think it was in the contender series where he was supposed to come in here, run through Julian Erosa, and then get his spot. But no, Julian head kicked him, 
and now we have Julian back in the UFC. It's a tough one. The, the odds right now are minus 230 for Emmers and a plus 180 for Skilly. And striker versus grappler, really. I know Jamal Emmers has some grappling, but Chas Skelly is the grappler here. Uh, they're both nearly identical, 5'10", 5'11", uh, one-inch height advantage for Skelly, and then a half-inch reach advantage for Emmers. So it's an interesting matchup for me. I, I'm leaning towards Chas Skelly, although he tends to kind of get outworked sometimes in, in certain positions. He, he's a good grappler, but other grapplers can really put him in bad situations. And we've seen him knocked out by Jason Knight, which was one of the craziest knockouts I've seen. And uh, yeah, I, I, I see a chance that Emmers can come in here and just run through Skelly, especially with that long layoff. But Something about Skelly, man. He's he's a tough dude. I, I think he can capitalize on those long limbs of Emmers and maybe get his uh, his Darks choke that he loves to get on dudes. I I'll take a shot on Chas Skelly at that plus one eighty dog money, but I'm not ultimately confident because if anything, Skelly does have the ability to get that submission in the first round. If if he can't get that, then yeah, Jamal Emmers might be able to just take over. Really, really back and forth between these two, but just because I, I like dog money and it's really hard to get Chas Skelly sometimes in that money odds, I'm going to go with Skelly to win by first round submission. I believe Jamal Emmers is going to have enough to stave off uh, to keep Chaz uh, from putting his lights out, uh, either through submission or some crazy, you know right on the button, knockout. And I think going back and looking at his fight with, with uh, Giga, uh, Giga, I think, is definitely a lot. I, I don't know if people give Giga the, the credit that he deserves, man, but he is uh, starting to become one of, my, one of my favorite fighters to watch. I'm looking at all his, oh, well, rather, I'd say I'm looking forward uh, to his future fights. Uh, he is, um, I, I think he's the, his name escapes me at the moment. Uh, he had that spinning back kick, knockout. Buckley? No, uh, no, uh, lightweight. He's now a, he's now a. Barboza? A Barboza, yeah. Uh, I think he's gonna, you know, I think he's the new Barboza and that, uh, he has some pretty damn good kicks. Uh, he's, you know, he's one of the best strikers, I think, yeah, in that division. And Jamal Emmers, you know, went toe to toe with him. He lost by split decision, but uh, the, I think that was a pretty close fight. Uh, yeah, he could have won that fight, but he didn't. Unfortunately, I think he was a good, good learning experience from him. Uh, Chas Skelly, I'm not really too. Uh, I, I think he's over the hill at this point. Uh, while he does, you know, he, you know, he might have. There's a possibility he might be the. You know the Jim Miller of that division, where you know even, you know facing a not necessarily young buck at this point, but younger guy. Uh, you know he doesn't. I don't. I don't think he has that same. Um, you know, um, same thing where he, if there's blood in the water, he's going to go in for the kill. Uh, you know, killer instinct that Jim Miller has. So I'm going to take Jamal Emmers by decision i think he'll take at least two of the three rounds you know even if say in the first round chas Kelly gets him on the ground and starts uh just out grapples him you know tries some chain submissions and whatnot once he gets past that i think jamal Emmers, jamal Emmers will take over the last two rounds and get that 29 28 unanimous decision our next fight at flyweight, we've got the return of the queen, Shayna Dobson, versus Casey O'Neill. Interesting matchup. I'll, I'll try not to talk too much about it, but Shayna Dobson coming in plus 145, slight favorite on the newcomer, uh, minus 170 for Casey O'Neill. It's, uh, yeah, is, uh, is Casey O'Neill good enough? Because we've seen what Shayna Dobson can do to girls who think they can run through her. Hagapova, what a dumbass. She had it in the bag, and then she just decided to uh, be an idiot. So I bet that fight. Luckily, I bet the fight the under 
which it covered, but I also had a side bet for uh, Agapova to win by finish, and she just, well, she did get finished, but besides the point, Casey O'Neill, I've seen some tape. She's from Scotland. She's a pretty aggressive, and she's got pretty good takedowns and submissions. I think, uh, I think she's not an idiot like Agapova, so I think she'll come in here and run through Shayna Dobson. Maybe not immediately. I think she's going to be smart enough not to fall into that trap because although we were all talking shit on Shayna Dobson, her record is garbage. She's 4-4 four and four with her overall record. She has some skill and very good on top with ground and pound. Uh, so as long as Casey doesn't gas herself out, I think she's got this in the bag. So I'm going to go with Casey O'Neill. I'm going to say round number one knockout. Uh, this being a uh, women's fight, I'm going to take uh, Casey O'Neill as well. I speak too much about it. I think Shayna Dobson is. I think she's just a. They're keeping her around as a punching bag for, you know, uh, younger fighters and uh, just really any fighters in that division. Um, the Maria Agapova fight was a fluke. That was that wasn't so much Shayna Dobson turning a corner and all of a sudden becoming a world beater and. Uh, title contender it was just maria agapova uh, you know just going bobby boucher and shitting the bed uh, i unfortunately had maria agapova by finish on that fight boy do i regret betting on women's mma I, I have more control over myself now and even though this past weekend i did foresee uh, pikachu face uh, beating what's her name I held myself back from betting on it just because it is women's MMA. And I'm going to do so here as well. Even though I, even though I believe Casey O'Neill will take the decision, I think she'll edge her out. Um, Shayna Dobson isn't, isn't going any, well, no, she is going somewhere. She's probably going to get cut after this fight. She will have lost four out of her last five fights. You know, she should have, she shouldn't have won that Maria Agapova fight, but she did. That was, I think, the biggest or one of the biggest upsets since uh, Holm and Rousey. But I think Casey O'Neill's skill set is uh, Shane Dobson is going to be able to keep up with her on her feet. So, yeah, I'll take uh, Casey O'Neill by a decision. Our next matchup at Featherweight, we've got Julian Juicy J. Rosa versus Nate the Train Landwehr. Interesting matchup. Fascinating odds, really. I did not expect this, but we've got a, a, a slight favorite for Julian and Rosa. They're near even. It's a minus 120 for Rosa and a minus 110 for Nate Landwehr. I honestly thought Nate was going to be the overwhelming favorite, maybe a minus 150. Uh, but seeing that this is uh, pretty close, it really shows how much respect you can get from being an undefeated guy. Julian Rosa beat Sean Woodson, a guy who everyone was super high on. Sean, the, the sniper, Woodson gasses out, gets uh, Darce choked by Julian Rosa in the, in the final round. Nate Landwehr, he he beat Darren Elkins in a fight that a lot of people thought Elkins could have won, but no, he just he battered Dar Darren Elkins. And then his last fight before that against Herbert Burns, he gets knocked out with a knee up the middle in the clinch. So I think that really reduced his stock. And people should not be sleeping on Nate, Nate, Nate the Train. He, he fought and was a champion in M1. He was set to fight Mozart Evloev, and whatever happened, happened. I can't remember why the fight was uh, was canceled, but now he's fighting a lesser opponent in Julian Erosa. I like Julian quite a bit, but he is very dis defensively lacking sometimes. He's been knocked out multiple times. He got head kicked by Julio Arce. He got decision pretty devastatingly by Grant Dawson, just ragged all them, and then Devontae Smith knocked him out. And uh, I see Nate Landwehr coming in here and actually running through Julian Erosa. Uh, whether it be first, second, or third round, I think Nate Landwehr is just the overall tougher, better guy. I wouldn't say his striking is as good as Julian's because Julian has a type of striking that it's not great, but it's, it's good. He can throw kicks. He's very diverse, but it's not technically sound, but it's quite effective. And, and that's a double-edged sword because you can throw some spinny winny bullshit and land and get the guy and throw a head kick and it lands and it gets the guy. But 
it's not always the most technical thing. So if you can see it coming, you can definitely defend it. And knowing that Julian's going to be throwing that type of shit for sure for the shorter guy, he's six foot one coming in against a guy who's a five nine. I think he's definitely going to be throwing a lot of head kicks. So I think Nate's going to be aware of that. But I do see Nate eventually landing that punch and then just putting out Julian Rosa. So I'm going to go with Nate Landwehr to win second round knockout. I'm actually taking Julian in this fight. I know Nate, uh, the train, the choo choo train Landwehr uh, is probably set to piece him up on the feet. But I'm not counting out Julian. Uh, he does have that. He does have that. Uh, whatever you want to call it, where, you know, um, in his actually in his last fight, uh, funny enough, I had, <laughs> I bet Sean Woodson who let me down. Uh, he gassed out, and what are you going to do? Julian took him out. And I think if Nate is not careful, Julian uh, will, he has that where he's going to, where he can jump on you uh, at a moment's notice and uh, either take a limb, take your neck, what have you. Uh, so I'm not counting them out. Um, so I'll take, uh, I think this, uh, I don't believe this fight will go the distance. Uh, so I'll take the under, or I should say I'll, I'll take, uh, uh, let's just leave it at it won't go the distance. Uh, but I am taking Julian, uh, I'll take Julian Rosa, even, even though he's the favorite, uh, I think, uh, I think the odds should actually favor Nate in this case, but they're not. Uh, so I'm taking Julian as an underdog in my mind, even though he's the favorite. I don't know if that makes sense, but in my mind, Nate's Nate, Nate's the favorite. Julian's the underdog, and I'm taking Julian as the underdog in my brain. Next matchup at bantamweight, we've got Eddie Wineland versus John Castaneda. Eddie Wineland coming back after a pretty devastating knockout loss to Sean O'Malley. And he's fighting the, not necessarily a newcomer, but in his sophomore fight, uh, John Castaneda. His, his fight was a loss to Nathaniel Wood. In a fight where Nathaniel Wood clearly won that fight, but watching it, I was a little a little impressed by by John because uh, Nathaniel Wood didn't, didn't finish him. And it was a short notice fight. And uh, I had this opinion of John because I've seen him fight in Combate Americas and I was not impressed by the guy. His nickname Sexy Mexi. I was like, fuck this guy. Um, but no, he he has been evolving, I would say, overall to a, to a certain level where I actually think he can beat Eddie Wineland at this stage. Because we know what Eddie Wineland brings. He brings that herky-jerky boxing style. Very good movement. Very good striking. It's just that he's just taken quite a bit of punishment. He's what one in three in his last four, and I'm not really, I'm not confident in his chin anymore. Odds right now minus one twenty five for John, and then a one o five for Eddie Wineland minus one o five for Eddie Wineland. So it's a slight favorite for for John, and I think the odds are are correct. It's a very close fight because we have to see if John is at that slightly above level than Eddie Wineland is now because this was what Eddie Wineland from four years ago there's no way John beats him he's just too good he's just too fast and too accurate but at this point I think John's going to grind him out he's going to land maybe a clean punch that might stun Eddie and then just take him down control him on the ground ground and pound just eke out a decision so I'm going to go with John to get his first UFC win by decision against Eddie yeah I can see that uh, I see I see I think this is too soon for Eddie to come back even though it's been eight plus months since uh, Sean O'Malley uh, put him to sleep I think at his age uh, he should have taken at least a year off uh, but I can see him wanting to get back in there uh, to prove that that was not necessarily a fluke but that, uh, I guess maybe that that was a fluke he wants to get in there and prove himself but he's proven himself against uh, this uh, somewhat, yeah, yeah. I mean, younger guy. Uh, his nickname aside, I think he is dangerous to Eddie in uh, in this particular instance, just due to uh, Eddie's brains uh, not uh, are getting unscrambled uh, in this short amount of time. 
and I say that because it was a pretty nasty knockout. It was just the one thing, and the, you know, one punch hit the canvas, and uh, you know, wake up and not know what what year you're in. Knockout. Uh, I'll take this. Uh, I'll take this fight uh, over. Uh, I give Castaneda the slight edge, uh, and the odds reflect that. And that's just due to that knockout, even though Eddie has a ton more experience. So I'm also taking uh, Castaneda close decision, maybe 29-28. I'd say Eddie maybe gets the better of him in the or maybe in the first round. Our next matchup at lightweight, we've got Vicar Close versus Luis Violent Bob Ross Pena. And I don't want to spend too much time on this one because, frankly, I'm not a fan of Jakar Close. I don't, I can't trust him to win a fight. And I'm definitely not a fan of Luis Pena because I can't trust him to win a damn fight against the guy who he's beating. Karma Worthy guillotine choked him in the most easy way because Bob Ross went in for a lazy-ass takedown and then just gave up the fight. I'm not a fan of that, guys that do that. So at this point, frankly, uh, I think Jakar Close has fought the better competition. He he nearly beat uh, Benio Darius, but Benio wasn't having any of that shit. Uh, I think he's just the overall, I don't want to say better guy, but I think he's just the tankier guy because they both kind of bring in the same basic game plan. I think Bob Ross is... Uh, Striking is better than Jakar Close, but Jakar Close does have that ace in the hole, which is that pretty devastating calf kick. And he's kind of a, a thicker guy, so it'll land a lot harder on Violent Bob Ross. Odds are right now minus 155 for Jakar Close and plus 135 for Luis Pena. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Jakar Close. Um, Luis Pena can potentially get this fight pretty easily. I think his striking is better. I think his, his submission game is better. I just don't see him outpowering Jakar Close. I really need to see something from these guys because it's one of those situations where as a better in the future, I, I don't even want to watch these guys fight because they, they tend to drop the ball. And it's not because they lost. It's just that they make silly mistakes in there and they have to redeem themselves. So I'm going to watch this fight closely. Haha, <laughs> Jakar Close. And hopefully... It's it's an entertaining one. Maybe they've just added something to their arsenal. They learned from their mistakes. But for the time being, Drakkar close tentatively decision. I agree. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this either, uh, and that's just due to uh, ginger, you know, ginger Afro puff letting me down in his last fight. Uh, he gets, I think, too overly confident. I think he's too high on his skills. Uh. Well, he does have some okay ground skills. He isn't. Um, I don't think he's anybody I'd uh, I'd want to. Uh, I'm looking to bet on, even if I do think he has some sort of uh, any sort of uh, advantage over the other guy. I don't think he has a striking advantage over Dukar. I think Dukar has uh, will be better on his feet. Uh, now, while. The actual face-off uh, is going to be interesting because he's going to have a six-inch height advantage over Dakar, so he's going to tower over this guy. But I think that's that's where his overconfidence is going to come into play, and he's going to make some sort of mistake, and he's probably going to get knocked out. Um, or maybe not even knocked out. I don't know. Maybe Dakar is going to submit him, uh, just like uh, Kama Worthy submitted him. And Kama... I would say uh, comma worthy is, or, or the comma worthy submission, I should say, uh, looks worse now just due to comma worthy's loss to uh, uh, Otman Azatar. And I think similar, you know, similar to comma worthy losing, I think, I actually think Trucar will probably take out Luis Pena or at least get, get a 30 27 decision. I would say there's a higher higher likelihood of that rather than doing a knockout, but yeah, I agree with the odds. Uh, I do not, nor will I ever, um, bet on Luis Pena to ever win again. He, you know, he'll probably get a win here, or, you know, some lucky win with somebody that gets overconfident themselves. But I think he's pretty high on, pretty high on his skills, uh, a lot higher than he should be. He's, I, don't know, I, I think he's over, overrated. 
So I'll take Kukrana. Our next matchup at Featherweight, we've got Jared Flash Gordon versus Danny the Colombian Warrior Chavez. Interesting matchup. Uh, we've got Chavez coming in as a minus 130 and plus 100 for Jared Gordon. And I remember, and I will say this, I remember Danny Chavez looking really impressive his last fight against TJ Brown, where I actually bet TJ Brown to, to come in here and, and beat up and uh, grind out Danny Chavez, but he, he didn't let that happen. Danny Chavez looked pretty good. And then I went and rewatched the fight, and yeah, he did well. It's just that it wasn't as impressive, impressive as I remember because Danny Chavez really landed really nice leg kicks that just beat up the legs of TJ Brown, which really led the, the dance from then on forward. TJ Brown couldn't get a takedown, thus making Danny Chavez's grappling look way better than I think it really is because he's going to need grappling to fend off Jared Gordon. I think Gordon is, he's a tough guy. I know he's been knocked out a couple of times. He got beat up by Charles Oliveira, but that's, that's no shame in that. Um, beat up by Diego Ferreira, no shame in that. And then uh, Joaquim Silva knocked him out two years ago. So he's had his share of, of, of defeats, but I think he's just a, a tough guy when it's really a toss up really. So if, if Danny Chavez can, can implement a striking early and then hurt Jared Gordon, I can see him potentially getting the knockout maybe in the second round. But if Jared Gordon is aware of of those leg kicks, which I, I know he will be, and it just implements his will over Danny Chavez, I can see him just beating him up on the ground. It's a coin flip fight for me. I will go with the dog in this situation with Jared Gordon to win. So I'm going to say he'll win maybe a, I'm going to say a decision. He's going to grind out Danny Chavez. Uh, I tend to agree, uh, and I think actually Jared has fought the better competition. Uh, the records aren't always indicative of, you know, how good these guys are, um, but definitely coming in, uh, coming into the UFC, uh, he definitely has fought the better competition. You know, taking an L to Charles Oliveira now, you know, seeing it how good or how far Charles has come in the last, uh, I'd say, two years or so, uh, doesn't make that. Uh, I think as bad of a loss as if, as opposed to if, uh, you know, uh, Charles is, uh, Charles is, uh, record had gone the opposite way. You know, if he, if he hadn't, if he had gotten pieced up by, um, El Kukui in his last fight, but he didn't, he took him over. I, th I think he could have submitted that, you know, submitted Tony, but he didn't want, I, I don't know if he didn't want to, or I don't know. I guess maybe he just wanted to show that he could go the distance with him, which was in itself, you know, pretty impressive. Uh, so I'll I'll just make it quick. I I, I think Jaron Gordon's going to take this, and I hope more money comes in for Danny because that would, you know, if Jaron Gordon becomes a you know, two to one underdog, that would be pretty sweet in my opinion. Our next matchup at heavyweight, we've got Andre the Pitbull Arlovsky versus Tom Aspinall. And we know the, the story right here. Tom Aspinall should come in here and knock out Andre Olovsky, the, the aging former champion who's been knocked out multiple times. The only thing with that is that we've seen some, not necessarily a resurgence from Andre Olovsky. It's just that if you're not on his level, regardless of his chin is gone or if he's just not the same fighter, he's not fast enough anymore, that he will beat your ass. And... I, I use the word beat your ass tentatively because he doesn't necessarily beat your ass, but he beats you and you feel like an ass. Uh, that's what happened with, uh, with Tanner Bozer. I actually bet Andre Arlovsky to beat Tanner Bozer because I didn't think he posed a threat. Tanner Bozer was primarily, a, a, he's a speed heavyweight. He's a, he's a smaller heavyweight, so he uses a speed advantage, but Andre Arlovsky is pretty damn good. He's a smart fighter, regardless of him getting clipped so many goddamn times. He knows how to fight guys. And he knows how to fight guys that implement his type of style. As for Tom Aspinall, he's on a really good win streak right now. He came in here and knocked out Jake Collier in, what, seconds, almost a minute or less. Knocked out Alan Boudat, some French Balrog-looking dude. It's it's an interesting matchup because at the odds right now, plus 200 for, for Arlovsky and a minus 260 for Aspinall, it's tempting to take Arlovsky because you might think maybe Aspinall isn't on that level. The only thing that makes me think opposite of that is that Tom Aspinall has knockout power. 
And regardless of you, if you're a plotting heavyweight, if you aren't the fastest dude, if you have that one punch knockout power, odds are Arlovsky's going to get caught. Um, the way Arlovsky's fighting right now, good good for him. He's very uh, conservative. He he attacks enough to to get the decision win. He even made comments of it. Just fighting smarter. I don't think that's going to work against Tom Aspinall. I think Tom Aspinall, if need be, will rush Arlovsky and then clip him. It does pose the possibility for Tom Aspinall to get hurt by Arlovsky, but you know what? Tom Aspinall by by knockout, pretty good prop. I'll end up going with that. So I'm going to go with Aspinall to win this fight. I think he is a pretty damn good fighter. I think he is trending upwards. Unfortunately, Arlovsky is going to fall into a right hand and then just get knocked out. So I'm going to go with Aspinall to win by knockout. I'm going to say first round. Funny. Uh, I think this this matchup reflects, or I should say mirrors, uh, the most recent matchup with uh, Volk, um, sorry, not Volkanovsky, uh, Volkov, uh, and the Reem, uh, in that you have a you know, European up and comer against, uh, you know, um, UFC and MMA veteran, you know, Arlovsky. And Arlovsky, you know, against uh, Jake Collier, uh, excuse me, I should say, <laughs> not Arlovsky. Um, yeah, Arlovsky in his uh, last. Uh, Last few fights, uh, you know, especially with uh, Anner Bozer and Philippe wins, he showed that he's, you know, he's the Brooklyn brawler uh, of MMA right now. Uh, he's, you know, if these young guys aren't, uh, are looking past him and you know, have their eyes on that belt, um, you know, he showed them that he can still edge out decisions against these younger guys who aren't ready for all of his, uh, for all of his, uh, all the experience that, Olofsky brings to the table. And I think this is going to be, I think if Aspinall can't get the knockout in the first round, or is going to get the you know, uh, 29-28 decision here. And I'm not necessarily shock the world, but just show, you know, show everybody that he's still, he's still got it at 42 years old. Uh, I don't know how much more time, you know, uh, only he knows what is, how much his body can take at this point being 42, but, He's not looking all that bad. Uh, I mean, if he's if he's still fighting for the love of you know for the love of the game, then good for him. But he's if he's fighting for for just, you know just for paychecks at this point, uh, that's gonna that's gonna I think reflect pretty fairly soon, especially at his age. But uh, Arlovski hasn't shown me anything uh, recently that would. Uh, state other well, no correction. Uh, he did get pieced up by uh, Rosenstruck, Sakai, uh, Shamil Abdu. I'm not going to pronounce his China or France his last name, and by Tai Tuivasa in the last few years. So, against you know, fairly, I would say, elite competition. Uh, Arlovsky, you know, he's 10 plus years way past his prime, but as as time has gone on, his chin has been tested and has been battle tested and as of late it's 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 been you know fairly solid you know he's he's had a late career resurgence similar to the ream and so i think uh arlovsky's you know uh kind of boxing style is is going to is going to put him on top here uh, with aspinall so i'll take uh, arlovsky by decision our next matchup is at middleweight. We've got Nasr Deed Imabov versus Phil Haas. And right now, near even odds, uh, minus 115 for Phil and Nasr Deed coming back, minus 110. I've been really, really critical on Phil Haas. I still think he might be a one-round fighter because he, he goes really hard in that first round. He knocked out uh, Jacob Malcorn, a guy who actually thought might have a chance against Phil Haas implementing a specific game style, uh, fighting style, I should say, that I actually think Nasruddin, Nasruddin might pull off, just kind of avoiding getting knocked out the first round, taking maybe a shot, and then just controlling the fight over in the later rounds. Uh, I will take Phil Haas in this one, first round knockout. Just It's too tempting, really. 
although I might be too critical on him, Nasruddin, his last fight, took too many punches clean from Jordan Williams, and I wasn't a fan of that. Uh, we'll see if he actually has a legendary chin, because if he can take a punch from Phil Haas clean, which I think he will, it'll show that he is on a legendary chin level because Phil Hall Phil Hall hits like a motherfucker. So I'm going to I'm going to take Phil Hall to win this one. I don't want to go too far discussing this one. It, it it's closer than what I'm making it seem because I I do see some value in Mimbov, but I I can't pass up the chance to take Phil Hall at a knockout. So I'm going to go knockout round number 1 Phil Hall. Okay, I won't go too deep into this one as well, but I'll take Megatron uh, by Cybertron right punch. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll take him at uh, I'll take him at, uh, at a knockout as well. Our next matchup, another heavyweight fight. We've got the return of the bow constrictor Alexei Olenek versus Chris Dacus. It's very similar to the fight between Arlovsky and and Tom Aspinall, where we got the aging guy coming in against a young up and comer looking impressive. Minus one eighty five favorite for Chris Dacus. Plus 150 slight underdog for Alexei Olenek. And this is a different different matchup because Olenek, despite his last loss to Derek Lewis, some might consider him just being at that point where his decline starts to, to show and be more evident. He recently beat Verdum to a split decision in a fight where I think he just beat his ass, made Verdum question the fact that he, you know, came back too damn early without really getting some rounds in sparring because he looked really off. It's one of those matchups. If you're not up to Alexei Olenek's level, you're going to get hurt and you're going to get submitted. And I'm going to actually go with, with Olenek. Despite Chris Dock is having really good striking and being a good ground fighter, I think him and his brother are pretty good at jujitsu. It's nothing in comparison with Alexei Olenek. He's seen it all. He's done it all. And honestly, he should have a pretty easy time because he took down Black Beast. He, he's taken down nearly everyone he's fought. And he's going to attack the submission. And I don't think Chris Dawkins has the power to to battle that. So I, I will go with uh, Alexei Olenek to get a submission round number one. Uh, I'm actually going with uh, Chris Dawkins here. And that's just due to, I don't think six months is enough time uh for his brains to have come you know to have, uh, for humpty dumpty to put himself back together so i think his brains are still scrambled especially at his age uh i think chris thought i don't know i don't know if chris Thoff is necessarily going to knock him out but i think he's going to piece him up on his feet and force Alexei to take it to the ground but i think chris is going to have enough at least defended i don't think he'll uh he may or may not actually submit Alexei. i wouldn't put it past him you know considering all this all the crazy finishes uh I've seen, uh, or unexpected finishers, I should say. Uh, I've seen as of late in a few matchups. Uh, but I think Chris has youth and the fact that his brains are fairly intact at this point. Uh, so I'll take the up-and-comer, Chris Dawkins, in this fight. Our next matchup at featherweight, we've got Derek Minner versus Charles Boston Strong Rosa. A very cut-and-dry matchup, in my opinion. We've got the overall better fighter in Charles Rosa, has fought in the UFC, fought the better competition. And we've got the pretty damn good grappler in Derek Minner. His his guillotine choke is money because he he gets it on anybody. He'll he'll submit anyone. He had uh, not Charles Oliveira. He had Davy Grant. Not Davy Grant, goddammit. Grant Dawson. I'm looking at his fucking name and I'm like, I can't I can't say it. Uh, he he had Grant Dawson in a bit of trouble. Grant Dawson is just a stronger, better grappler, so he was able to to survive that submission attempt from Derek Minner. Uh, he's a pretty overall good guy. I like Derek Minner. He actually made me quite a bit of money betting that submission prop against TJ Laramie because if you don't respect that guillotine choke, he's going to get you. Charles Rosa, though, I know he is going to respect that guillotine. I think his striking is is better. He, he decisioned Kevin Aguilar, a pretty damn good striker, just using his weird kicks and, and striking. His grappling, although he got dominated by Bryce Mitchell, he never got submitted by Bryce Mitchell, even though he was in some pretty pretty deep submissions. I, I like Charles Rosa in this one. Of course, there's a chance Derek Minner can get that submission, but I really doubt it. I really doubt he'll get that submission on Charles Rosa. I think he's just too damn crafty. 
although I'm not incredibly high on Charles Rose, I just do see him being a step above Derek Minner overall, especially with cardio. Minner does tend to go balls to the wall, trying to get that submission, which I respect the shit out of. It's just that you will gas out the era style and you'll just get taken over. So I'm going to go with Charles Rose to win this one by decision. Uh, you hit it right on the money. Uh, I think the odds reflect. That's a close, a fairly close matchup, but uh, yeah, tr- uh, I, bl- I also agree. Charles Rosa getting that decision. Our co-main event, another bantamweight matchup. We've got Caitlin Vieira versus Yana Kunitskaya. I hope that's not a trend because the Macy Barber and Alexa Grasso fight being the co-main event. The last card wasn't good, and this one's a step above in my opinion, but I'm I don't like it. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Yana Kunitskaya, uh, Foxy Yana Kunitskaya. It's hard to really go into much detail about this one. She is a decent mid-tier win- women's bantamweight. But Caitlin Vieira, I think she is just a step above. Her her last fight against uh, Soraya Eubanks, she put a staple on that, you know, you have to be a, a, a slight step above or an equal playing field to fight her and win. And although she had a, a setback against Irina Aldana via devastating left hook, I think she got too goddamn complacent with her striking. She thought her striking was getting better, just piecing girls up. Her her grappling is where it's at. I think she's just super strong. She's a good grappler. I think she's a judo black belt, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Yana Kunitskaya. She's getting that dick from Maheta, so maybe that's giving her some Thor-like powers, but I really don't see that translating that well in the UFC against Caitlin Vieira. I'm going to go with Caitlin to win this one by decision. I think she's going to use her grappling heavy heavy uh, output and then just ground and pound her on the ground. I know uh, Kunitskaya is pretty good and opportunistic on the ground with submissions, but I just don't see her outpowering Caitlin Vieira. I'm going to go with decision Vieira. I think as long as Caitlin can avoid Yana Kuniskaya's, uh just lean fighting style, just pushing and holding girls against the fence, uh, she should be able to, you know, take it pretty easily. Um, I have no idea why they still have Yana Kuniskaya in the UFC. Uh, that that is the most annoying style, one of the more annoying styles, of just holding people against the fence and not really doing much. Uh, I hope Caitlin. I'm gonna take Caitlin by decision, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't I wouldn't be sad if she knocked out or submitted in the sky. So Caitlin by decision, but hopefully maybe she makes it a little bit more exciting. Our main event of the evening, we've got Curtis Sonia Blades versus Derek Black Beast Lewis. And I think everyone breaking down this fight on the internet has the same talking points. Curtis Blades is going to take down Derek Lewis, or Derek Lewis is going to knock out Curtis Blades. It, it can't go either or. Um, I think the higher likelihood of of a knockout comes from Curtis Blades, because I don't think he's, he's that stupid to stand with Derek Lewis for too long. And honestly, I don't see anything else Derek Lewis can do. He, if he can't get the knockout on the feet, he tends to go for the ground and pound. He actually prefers the ground and pound, in my opinion, because he, he goes for it quite often. And then when he gets on top of you, you're you're fucked. But Curtis Blades, that's his bread and butter. He's not going to... Can you picture a world where Derek Lewis takes down Curtis Blades? I cannot fathom that at all. Uh, the odds reflect that. It's a minus 365, minus 365 all day, every day. Uh, for Curtis Blades and a plus 280 for Derek Lewis. And I think the odds are, are right on the money. I know some people might be disrespecting Curtis Blades because of his last fight with Volkov. Volkov is a top 10 UFC fighter. He's frankly top five. I can see him fighting for the championship any 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 fight now. Uh, that was a tough fight for Curtis Blades and he, he edged it out. I know he's, he was exhausted after that fight, but you, when you're dealing and grappling with a guy that heavy and that strong, and that goddamn tall, it's going to tire you out. I don't see any resistance from, from Derek Lewis when it comes to the takedown. So I, I have Curtis Blades to win this one any way he wants. I can even see Curtis Blades slamming Derek Lewis so damn hard that his back gets hurt again, which I, I hope it doesn't happen. I know Derek Lewis has had back issues in the past. 
and that's really hindered him sometimes when it comes to to his fighting style. He lost to uh, who did he lose to? I think Mark Hunt. He got beat by Mark Hunt, and you can just tell he wasn't the same. And he, he's looked better, but he he got taken down by Blagoy and Latifi, smaller guys in the UFC heavyweight division. And Curtis Blades isn't one of the smaller guys. He's just gonna blast double him, take him down, easy peasy. He's a Derek, Derek Lewis is a turtle on his back, and it, it's sad to say because I like Derek Lewis so damn much, but this is not a fight for him, right? I actually thought Alexi would have beaten him, but we've seen that Alexi can get overpowered, and I do not see Black Beast overpowering Curtis Blades whatsoever. He can, of course, get that opportunistic knockout if Curtis Blades starts thinking he's a striker now, but no, I don't think he he's going to he's going to stray away from that game plan. I got blades to win this. It, it could go a decision. I doubt it though, because I honestly don't consider Derek Lewis to be one of the more durable guys. So I'm going to say it's going to go the under, I, I can see a knockout in any one of the, the first few rounds for sure under four and a half, but I do have Curtis blades to win. I'll say second round knockout. Now, one thing I, I need to point out is the UFC uh, official poster for this fight. Uh, and we're going to rename Curtis to uh, Curtis Needs a Training Bra Blades uh, because the poster is is not too flattering. Uh, I think uh, Curtis definitely needs one of those uh, female uh, training bras to fight, man, because I, I cannot look at that poster anymore. Anybody looking at that poster will, will see exactly what I mean. <laughs> Curtis Big Titty Blades. Yeah. Now, uh, that being said, uh, this is how I actually see the fight going. Uh, in the first round, Derek is going to come out uh, pretty aggressive, pretty strong. He's going to, you know, throw bombs at, at Curtis, and I think Curtis is going to survive that and probably start taking him down. I'd say within a minute and a half, two minutes, and the Black Beast is going to, you know, either he's going to scramble uh, back up to his feet, which he actually does. He is very good at, at least in the first two rounds, I would say, depending on his cardio. Uh, or he might stuff a takedown or two, but Curtis is relentless. That's that's his bread and butter. So he's going to keep going, and being that, you know, Derek Lewis isn't exactly a high-output cardio guy, it's pretty, you know, he can probably stuff maybe two or three of them in the first round, but from then on, he's just going to get, uh, they're going to go, nip, you know, nipple, nipple, uh, you know, per Colby Covington. For maybe two, two and a half rounds. And maybe around the third or fourth round, Derek, he's going to come out, you know, after, you know, uh, at the beginning of the bell, he's going to come out pretty aggressive and throw one of those haymakers, which may or may not, you know, hit Curtis. But I think more, more than anything, Curtis is going to wear him out and probably get a fourth round. I see maybe um, not a rear naked choke. Uh, I would say a, um, Jeez, the submission escapes me. It's when he has his arm uh, pressed up against his neck, and then arm triangle. Arm triangle. There we go. Uh, I think maybe an arm triangle, or possibly even ground and pound. I think uh, Curtis might pass his guard into full mount and just start raining those elbows like he did against Overeem. Uh, so Curtis is going to have his way. I think Derek is going to have a few moments and add some excitement to an otherwise pretty bland, uh, typical. Curtis needs a needs a training bra blades, uh, but I think Curtis is going to take this fight and be next in line uh, for a UFC uh, heavyweight title shot after John Jones. I'm I'm pretty sure they're going to give it to Jones. Um, you know, the winner of the Miocic and Ganu fight, he's going he's going to get Jones, and then I think Curtis is going to hold out and get that next title shot. Who would you get between well, Jones and Blades? Between Jones and um, I would say Jones. Uh, he's. I saw a few Instagram videos. He's looking pretty big, and I think I don't think he's gonna go into, you know, his first heavyweight fight, uh, just and rely just solely on strength or you know his his newfound uh, bulk. He's going to make sure that he has the cardio to to back up. You know whatever he, you know his. He's going to have the same. I think, or similar cardio to what he had at light heavyweight. Uh, so he's going to have the same, I think, size as Curtis, maybe, uh, but he's going to have way better cardio. 
So I'll take Jones, and he's going to have better striking uh, than than Blades. If if it comes down to a number one contender fight between Blades and Jones, I'll take Jones. And also, one thing to keep in mind is that Blades is uh, the bigger, blacker version of uh, Olenek, Latifi, Ivanov, and even Cormier, who you know took down. Uh, took down Lewis at will. Even I think even Dos Santos, if I remember correctly, took down took down Lewis. So Lewis has been realistically take, been taken down uh, at least once in his one, two, three, four last five fights over the past uh, two and a half, two plus years. Yeah. So I mean, if uh, if Alexei Olenek was able to take him down, you know, the, the I think the best wrestler in the moment at the moment. Uh, in the heavyweight division is definitely gonna have his way with him. So his his only chance is is you know one of those hyper you know um, uh, you know one of his uh, hyper uh, right hooks or whatever that he just you know has takes whatever adrenaline he has left at the moment and just puts it into one one hail mary punch that you know he hopes he's gonna get the knockout. Which you know is what makes him was was what has made him a fan favorite at this point. Yeah, I actually see if anything, if Derek gets a knockout, it's going to be by flying knee. But he he has so so many rounds to do it because if it if it goes extended if it goes extended to like the third round, like he might try that shit every opening of the of the round if it gets extended. But he's just going to gas out. The first round is the most dangerous, Derek Lewis. Curtis Blades knows that. Second round, he's still dangerous. He has a way to conserve bits of energy where he can just explode, but he only has maybe one or two per round. So it's it's he's a dangerous guy, but I yeah, I don't see Curtis Blades falling into that trap. Yeah, normally yes, but I think Blades is tall enough to where that knee isn't gonna work. Um, uh, but also actually, I think he's tall enough to where that knee isn't gonna work if Blades is standing. But if he somehow times that knee correctly while Blades is coming in for a takedown, uh, either lazily or he's just, you know, uh, has that adrenaline dump uh, some, somewhere in the second, third round. Uh, it's it's a possibility. He might be able to get him if he times that thing correctly and goes to ground and pound. So I'm, I'm not putting it past him. That'd be fun to watch. But uh, those have been our picks for UFC Fight Night Blades versus Lewis. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. If you don't, your polys are going to go to shit. But that's been us from Tiger Bomb MMA, Johnny and Jose. We'll catch you at the next fight.